Well, we believe that this is quite a crucial part of um, the debate. Uh, and it would <laughs> be a good idea, as many of you represent charitable organizations as well. And it is a, a big area in the equine world. And we hope that this will help tease out certainly the issues that you all face, but how relevant also the debate we've been having um, earlier today is, not least of all, the use of technology and the register and how, how we can make that work better uh, for welfare and conditions of horses. So how do charities fit into the modern world? Well, I hope you feel that we've got a very good representation here on the panel. Uh, Tim Greet has, has got real experience um, <coughs> both with horses as an equine surgeon in Newmarket, but particularly in his role as uh, a spanner trustee for as being uh, extremely important to this debate. Uh, and he also sees a very wide definition of welfare in that role uh, uh, in Spana, uh, slightly different levels of that. Um, he does have interests outside of work, which is, judging by what he's doing, quite difficult. Um, he does apparently play golf, which is not so surprising, but also the guitar. Although I'm reliably informed not at the same time. Um, Jeanette Allen, uh, yeah, I think most of you will uh, have come across Jeanette in her various roles, but particularly through the Horse Trust, uh, and the running of the, uh, of course, the original home of rest for retired service horses. But the Horse Trust is, of course, the second largest funder of equine veterinary research in the UK. So it has played a really important role in getting our knowledge base to where it is now. Um, Jeanette did have a previous existence um, in I think in a number of different areas, but not least of them was as a Jack the Ripper tour guide <laughs> <laughs> on an aptly named bus trip to murder, which we, <laughs> we hope is not going to be repeated today. Um, although on one particular night, they did such an incredibly good job that the passengers on tour were genuinely held up at gunpoint. But it was such a convincing tour they gave the robbers a round of applause when they finished. <laughs> <laughs> and they got away with nothing. Anyway, it's very convincing. Um, Ed Brasher, I'm afraid, it, it, well, um, it's been going on quite a long time with the RDA, but he's been chief executive of the RDA since 2004, though he's usually involved in the sector before that. And of course, we've been hearing a little bit about that from the minister today, so thank you to, to him for the 18,000 volunteers and the 28,000 uh, uh, riders who take advantage of what we have been trying to offer over many years, but we keep learning more. And we're very much looking forward to the first national training center at Warwick, which will be opened in this year, which is our 50th anniversary year. Um, Ed is not content just with horses. I gather he's, he's getting connected with a new charity, which is about, um, Level Water, which supports young disabled children to start swimming. And this is um, frying pan less hot. Ah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> and Emi Fore, we're very pleased that he's joined us today because as a world-class international dressage rider, but he also started, of course, the Emi Fore Foundation in 2006. And because he feels passionate about the, giving the less privileged children, the ones who have less likely to get access to horses and riding and who live in inner city areas, the opportunity to be more involved in horses. And he's doing something which, you know, many other charities say, oh, don't go there because it's too difficult. But he's doing it and he's, he's doing it with passion and he's doing it with understanding. So for us, it's, I think, a very important member of our panel, because it's a scale of enterprise, which is very specific, um, but it's quite small and very dedicated. And I probably don't need to tell you that he is a multiple British team championship rider as well. Now, we'll move on, if that's right, straight to our questions. Um, and I very much hope that those who ask the questions will not only tell us who they are, but they will stand up to do so which would be gratefully received by here in the panel because it's a lot easier, but also for those uh, watching on the podcast and um, live streaming, also makes it a lot easier uh, to hear. So can we start uh, with our 
opening question from Paul Jepson. Uh, Paul Jepson uh, are, are you going to use a... That would be nice, too. <laughs> <laughs> come here every year. You have the same instructions. Uh, Paul <laughs> Jepson, representing these days retraining of racehorses. Um, my question is, does the panel think there are too many equine charities, which necessitates them spending large sums of money competing uh, against each other and depleting a very finite pool of charitable giving? Thank you very much. Um, Tim, you're very much involved at the moment. Yeah, I, I guess this is a, a, an understandable view that uh, I've often heard expressed by equine interested people and including potential donors. And indeed, it's a question that I think as charities we often ask ourselves from time to time. However, the reality is that um, individual charities, either by design or more probably by evolution, um, Spana is nearly 100 years old, um, secure themselves a niche in the practical world in which we mostly inhabit. So in Spana's case, that is by the delivery of free veterinary care to animals in the poorest countries, um, the education of animal owners and uh, the general public, and in particular children. Equally importantly, we're unique in that we help with the education of veterinary students in our core countries within Africa, Asia, and the Middle East and we are creating clinical skills centers that makes us different from other charities. Other charities devote their attention perhaps more to advocacy or community training, and of course we do that too. For example, in the um, production of practical harness manufacture using locally available materials. Perhaps more importantly though, as charities we can act synergistically. So, on occasion, we have to come together, and, and in the equine charitable world in which sector we, we work in, our CEOs meet regularly, um, and as chairman, we at least meet once a year. How does this work in a, in a synergistic way? Well, to give you a, a good recent example, in relation to the appalling Chinese donkey skin trade, Spana has cooperated with the Donkey Sanctuary, World Horse Welfare, the Brook, and the RSPCA, amongst other organizations, to lobby appropriate governments in an attempt to end this horrendous slaughter of donkeys in Zimbabwe, Botswana, and other parts of Africa. So I, I believe that, although there are a number of us, we can act very much in a symbiotic way. Thank you very much. We'll just, I think we'll continue the process. Um, I'll be quite simple. Yes, the synergies are really, really important and shouldn't be underestimated. Wherever agencies can work together and cooperate, trust us, we do. Um, and we're working even harder as we go ahead on getting our messaging to be as similar as possible when it comes to talking to owners and keepers about things like best practice. Um, the challenge I'd throw back to the questioner would be, Obviously, there aren't too many because we all still exist. And that means that donors are deciding there is enough point of difference between each organization's specialties in order to choose to give, you know, pick which organization they wish to support. When donors decide to stop supporting, you will go out of business pretty quickly. So I think we are responding to donor need and those charities that do begin to maybe fail financially quite often a, another charity will come in and absorb them and, and do a sensible merger. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd agree with much of what's already been said. I think uh, charities in general have a duty to be really clear about uh, what the purpose of the charity is and what the impact that charity is having. And if you can't define that clearly to your supporters, really picking up Jeanette's point, I think supporters will, will drift away from you. Um, and I think the way we uh, cooperate as charities is important as well. And I'd also slightly challenge the suggestion that we spend large amounts of money on marketing, um, because I think actually proportionally, uh, you know, it's an important thing 
uh, for someone like me to be clear about is that we're not spending large amounts of money on marketing. We're being appropriate with that. So um, I, said, I guess I'd push back on that point a little bit. Well, I think everything has been said, um, and, and I agree uh, very much that we spend absolutely no money on marketing at all, <laughs> uh, none whatsoever. Um, with social media these days, I hardly think it's, it's uh, necessary to, to run very expensive ad campaigns. Thank you. Um, just as a, a, a slight distraction, but in the um, world in which Save the Children functions, they have a thing called the Disasters Emergency Committee, which stops some of the main international agencies all fighting each other for funds at specific moments. And I, a, a, is a concept, you, you, you might say that for, under certain conditions, that would, might be something that equine charities might want to do, but it would need to be for something very specific. And I do think people have their own particular interests in um, the activities the charities are, uh, are pursuing. And as Ed says, if you're clear about that, and people feel there's a difference, or there's a very local attachment, which makes sense because you, you want to be part of it, uh, there is quite a lot of scope there. But I, it's always a question, I think, that needs to be asked, to be honest, I think, um, and people have to be very wary about, as Emil's bravely done, set up their own uh, charities, and they need to be aware of what's going on out there. And in today's world of technology, it's not as if you can't find um, what is already out there, and, and people do really should be responsible enough to do that. And I th it's, a, it's a question that, is worth everybody asking themselves from time to time and maybe seeing how the technology, the understanding, and maybe alternative methods um, might be used to give people more confidence in, in, in who they were giving their money to and why. Uh, but I do think at the moment that's, that is a very much widely appreciated issue. So could we go on to the next question from Jessica Stark, I think. Thank you. Uh, Jessica Stark from World Horse Welfare. Um, how can charities uh, work more effectively with their supporters and others to bring about change? Thank you very much. Emil, you're very, you have a very specific interest in, in motivating a group. How do you think you can do that? Um, well, let's start off by saying that, that we as a nation are actually an incredibly generous nation when it comes to donating to charities. Uh, I, I think we're one of the leading countries in that. And, and that means more so that we need to, to take care of our supporters. And I think one of the first things and one of the most important things is information. People, when they spend their money, uh, uh, for a charity, they want to know what they get for their money. Times are tough and people are tightening belts. And um, I think it's incredibly important that people know exactly where their money is going to. And therefore, it is very important for me that our supporters know exactly what their money is getting. Um, I think it's important that your supporters know your exact goals, exactly why you do what you do. And that, again, comes down to information. Keeping your supporters engaged, of course, that becomes easier now with social media. But um, I think we need to also remember that there still is a place for the good old-fashioned paper sometimes. Uh, we do produce our own homemade newsletters. Uh, um, and I think we distribute those at appropriate places. And I think it is also something tangible that people can uh, uh, take with them and, and see and another way of getting information across. I think one of the most important things for charities is transparency. Transparency about financial matters, transparency about exactly what your charity is aiming to achieve, what it is doing. And people want to know stories. People want to understand what the outcome of, of what it is you do. We were 
uh, very fortunate some time ago that a, a BBC documentary was made about one of the children that our um, charity supported. And um, it was a very well-received documentary and in fact was nominated for a BAFTA award. But certainly after the, the, the airing of, of this um, documentary, the interest raised tremendously and we were able to uh, um, get more funding and more people had, had visited our website. So I think a question of making sure that your supporters know exactly what you're doing, which basically brings it down to information, information. Uh, yes, I agree with Emil. I think um, uh, the being absolutely clear about one's impact and how you define that and being able to measure it uh, is a really key thing. So a, a constant issue for RDA is informing people that we're not a charity that just takes disabled kids for pony rides. We're actually delivering real and meaningful mm -hmm. therapy and we're developing uh, skills and talent to allow people to achieve amazing things. And if we can get that message across to people, we engage in supporters um, uh, um, and we, we can develop that. I think um, one of the things I also just wanted to raise under this bit was actually uh, thinking about the support we get in terms of volunteers. So RDA has to raise a lot of money every year, but we also have to find uh, engaged support and, and keep about 18,500 volunteers. So making sure we're up to speed with uh, training, education, all of the support that they need, I think is a really important way of, of engaging effectively. And the kinds of things we've heard this morning, passing those on to our volunteers to make sure that we're um, ahead of the game or at least up to speed with those issues is, is a really important way for us to, to make sure we can kin continue to bring about the kind of change that we set out to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've also, as, as charities specifically, as a sector as a whole, we've really come together in recent times to um, affect change. So we've, we've, we're not just being charities talking amongst ourselves anymore, which we always were pretty good at. Uh, you know, we're now properly engaged with sport, with racing, with trade. It's, we are a whole sector, and the charitable sector is part of that bigger picture. So that's a really important place where change comes from because that's where you get something as tangible as a legislative change. Um, other change, though, is achievable within the charitable sector, and everything from National Equine Welfare Council to the chief executives of British Equine Charities, we have lots of ways um, of working together as a group of voluntary organisations to do better. And I have to say more and more of what we're doing is now dual badged, triple badged, quadruple badged, um, because we, we do understand that we have different groups of supporters and the stronger the collective is that's giving the message, the more impactful the message is likely to be. Yep. I'd just to say that uh, from Spana's point of view, we, we feel sufficiently strongly about this to now involve our supporters directly in creating our strategies of the future. So on, uh, on Monday, we're going to meet in London with our supporters, the staff and uh, our trustees in order to try and uh, improve and uh, continually refine our strategy for the future. Thank you very much. I think the business of information and how you handle it um, and how you define the education part of it, I mean, increasing invitation, giving more confidence to the, your supporters. Um, it's, okay, you could define it slightly differently, but it has become a key uh, activity because you own an awful lot of very useful information and you have a huge amount of experience which can be passed on. And we were looking at the figures of the numbers of people who, of horse owners, who are not engaged uh, with an established organization earlier, which is about 75% of them. So that actually, all of you charities are probably engaging with some of that 75%. And how you relate the next pieces of information which are getting lost in, in, um, through the official channels uh, could be really key and being effective between you in understanding how best to do that and the messages that need to be put across. Um, it comes under that heading because you're all passing on information, but it's understanding where the hidden people are and how you reach them, which I think has been raised today. So thank you very much 
for, uh, for that and bringing, again, that subject up. Uh, which leads us on to, uh, rather neatly, to the next question from Rosie Mogford. <laughs> Rosie Mogford, Blue Cross. With the spotlight on horse health, in particular the flu outbreak, what's the place of horse welfare charities in protecting our UK horses and ensuring the industry stays ahead of the game? Can you cope with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've had the... Definitive answer to where we are with equine flu at the moment this morning from, from Richard. Um, I have to say that Spana is a charity that working exclusively overseas is, can, uh, finds flu somewhat of lesser significance <laughs> to our animals than. Uh, horse so we're dealing with African horse sickness and West Nile and, uh, and more chronic problems such as epizootic lymphangitis, which is a debilitating and can cause massive welfare problems. So. <laughs> Our focus is more on those things. Uh, and I absolutely have to say that uh, animal charities must assume a significant remote role in promoting good equine health. Um, uh, this is irrevocably connected to equine welfare. Uh, as regards um, equine influenza specifically, uh, of course, um, as you know, many horses used for pleasure and all competition horses in this country must be vaccinated against influenza. However, as we've heard this morning, flu is very clever, as with human influenza, and it's uh, prone to mutation, making um, the creation of, of an effective vaccine very challenging. Um, however, we've got examples, and um, as recently as 2007, there was a catastrophic influenza epizootic in Australia, a, a naive equine population. Um, and it just went through the eastern states like wildfire from imported horses from Japan. And so our card is clearly, Mark Richard has already said it this morning, it's vitally important that, that horses are vaccinated. And I think as equine charities, we have an important role in making horse owners aware, in educating people. And I think that's something that, that we must not shy away from. Mm. Well, we fund Richard, so that's, that's one of the things we do. Um, just, just saying. Uh, um, the important thing that I know my wonderful patron would like us to say is the Animal Health Trust has been talked about a great deal, quite rightly. Please remember they're a charity. Um, that's a very important point, and they do need funding in order to continue their work, and industry needs to pay their way as well. So I think racing has done very well, and perhaps there's more, as Jane said, that could be done. Um, for the, the rest of the horse owning population. But yeah, funding, funding the science, that is really, really important, and some of us can do that. Um, and then there are other things we can do that are very simple. So we had a meeting of our little chief executives gang um, earlier in the year when flu was just hitting the radar, and we all discussed the measures we were going to take for visitors coming on site. And everyone is pretty much taking the same measures and giving the same messages. Flu can't hurt you, but you can take it from one horse to another, and that includes the one you pet when you take the dog out for a walk. You don't have to be an owner or a rider. Please use the hand gel. Please use the foot dip. And by the way, do it on the way out, because you need to be protecting your horses as well. And actually, there is a way in which uh, Richard's long wished for desire for a flu outbreak has proved entirely helpful, um, which is... You know, it is leveraging huge amounts of public awareness, and I think ultimately, if why would we take down these new stations we've all put up at our visitor entrances? Why don't we just keep them going? Because it's not just flu, it's strangles, it's equine herpes, herpes virus, and actually all yards all the time should now be just spending that extra minute with people coming on and off the yard, like we all spend the extra minute to put our seatbelt on. Mm. Actually, we mentioned this earlier when you're talking about the, the links and where it, you can transfer. But um, Beta is, is not a charity, but actually most horse owners have equipment. And they secondhand buy and sell or they take it into shops as well as out. And it may be that it's an area we've kind of forgotten about, but it, it can often be um, a way you can transfer disease very, very simply and very easily. And they'd be a very important part of that network uh, in getting that message across, I think. 
Sorry, no, do you want to add to that? Yes, well, I mean, of course, we, we are uh, not an equine welfare charity. In fact, we're not really an equine charity. We're a charity that is about people, but albeit... We depend on equines. We depend on equines, <laughs> and we're part of the community, proudly so. So, uh, for us, the... Uh, the sort of interest in, in uh, horse health and particularly the flu is, um, I think, an important opportunity for us to uh, check what's in place, provide training, uh, push procedures, and as, as Jane Nixon said, really, use it as a wake-up call and make sure that we've got, got things in place. So really, uh, just following on from what Jeanette said, it's actually making sure uh, we have things in place we close gaps where we don't think we, we have and provide more support and training for those uh, staff and volunteers who are looking after our horses. Thanks very much. Um, yes, also not really my, my area of expertise, but um, I think that as we use BHS-approved uh, riding schools, I think it is, is really the responsibility of both the BHS and also the owners of these riding schools to be educated enough. Uh, a lot of the times the riding schools that, that uh, our children ride at are very, very small inner city riding schools that struggle to survive anyway. Um, and um, I think it's a matter of education more than anything. Thank you very much. Well, certainly I think the, the concept of funding the science is not, is, is, could be crucial in the long run. Um, but wearing another hat on I, and notice that Richard's saying we do need to invest in more equipment should anybody be interested <laughs> <laughs> something which is more long running because it's amazing how this disappears off the radar until you get another flu vaccine is everybody where is the equipment I just didn't mention that passing um, right we'll move on then uh, if that's all right um, Jim you're going to ask this question uh, thank you Mel um, Listen carefully. This is a completely different subject area that we've discussed so far. Uh, with such strict codes of governance applying to national governing bodies with regard to the appointment of non-executive directors, how do charities choose trustees to ensure that they have the right balance of charity-related and industry or business-related skills and knowledge? Thanks, Tim. You did, um, you did. <laughs> I think I was voluntold by Georgina for this one. Um, the simple answer is pragmatically. Um, there's a, a finite pool of those people out there. Um, most charities don't have any statutory funding within the, if they're in the, operating in the animal sector, they might have statutory funding if they're working with people or children. Um, children are people. Anyway, you know what I mean. Um, small people. Um, but Obviously, within the animal sector, there's government funding doesn't really exist, um, and so, which is why charities are necessary. Um, but that means that we don't have some of the same rules as would apply to, to organisations that are having to cope with statutory funding and, and their demands on, on the governance of a charity. Having said that, governance of any charity is absolutely vital. Um, and it's, it's completely right, that mix that Tim described of, of passion and practical and business skills and often specialist expertise. And everyone has their own way of doing it. I can, from nearly 20 years of being a charity chief executive, there is no right or wrong answer. Advertising works for some people or it works for some roles. Uh, using networks works very well, and sometimes when you're dealing with extreme specialisms like uh, scientific research into equine-specific diseases, there's a very small fishing pool to go fishing in. So we just have to be pragmatic. We have to manage conflicts, and we have to just be sure that our donors are happy with how we're governing ourselves. Um, and again, that goes to Emile's previous point about transparency. Um, but there is no one-size-fits-all answer. Thank you very much. Yes, I, mean, I think this is, this is a really important point, and I think um, there's a lot more interest, and rightly so, in this. I'd say, um, uh, picking up what Jeanette said, being really clear about what skills you need as, as uh, trustees and what you need on your boards is, is probably the starting point. Um, I guess I, I feel a sense of frustration at the moment that there seems to be a lack of joined-up thinking particularly at a government level, in that uh, RDA is an organisation 
with a foot in the sport world, uh, mainly a charity. So the UK uh, Sport Governance Code, which I think is a good thing, but they don't appear to have spoken to the Charity Commission putting it together. So if you take an organisation like RDA, we're working in three jurisdictions, that's England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and trying to keep our, our, uh, our constitutions and governing documents compliant with the Charity Commission, UK Sport, uh, the Office for Scottish Charity Regulation, the Northern Ireland Charity Commission and the sports bodies in both of those countries or areas as well. Um, and they don't quite join up, which is um, a bit frustrating. When it comes to the actual appointment of trustees, though, I think um, being clear about uh, the skills you want to bring um, onto your board and one of the things that uh, we did a few years ago at RDA and we're trying to uh, replicate across our groups is being clear about having um, specific roles or portfolios for, for trustees. So you, you cover areas off and you, you, we run the risk of just bringing in people who love horses and or have an interest in disability and therefore want to be a trustee. That's great, but actually if they don't have some of the skills you need, um, it doesn't work. And I think the other thing is, I think diversity is a really good thing. Um, but as I mentioned when we were having coffee earlier, um, the good example of, the, uh, of us failing on the UK governance code is that 91% of our trustees are male, oh, female, female. sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I, I understand that's not a priority at the moment. Maybe if it was the other way around, it would be. Um, but um, uh, I think diversity is a good thing, but also so is representation. So uh, actually 92% of RDA's volunteers are female. So you could argue that the board adequately represents um, that constituency of what we do. So um, uh, diversity, yes, but being clear about skills and representation, I would say probably trumps that. Yeah. Uh, even though yeah. we uh, fund nearly 16,000 children a year to ride, we are a very small uh, um, charity. And um, with basically, we're a two-man band. Um, we have <coughs> only three trustees because we felt that a lot of the time when people want to come on board as, as a trustee, it's normally at a social occasion, a couple of glasses of Chardonnay too many, and they want to come on board <laughs> as a trustee um, and feel uh, uh, they want to do something. However, when it really comes down to actually putting the man hours in and actually getting down to, to doing the work, then suddenly... Um, a few excuses come up here and there. So I think uh, know your people. Know your people that, that you want uh, as trustees and, and make sure that their intentions are uh, uh, for the benefit of your charity. And ask a busy person if you want something yeah. done. Yeah. <laughs> tends, to, tends to be true. Did you, did you, uh, just you to say that, uh, again, I think we're probably a little bit different, although we confront many of the same issues that, that have been discussed with our, my colleagues here. Um, we also have uh, a number of our countries which are francophone, so language skills are required. Understanding the situation in parts of Africa, these are skills that are, are difficult to acquire. So, uh, as you said, often you're fishing in a relatively small pool for trustees. So a pragmatic approach is important, and uh, we will constantly review uh, our trustees' aud skills audits and try to complement areas where we feel we're a little bit light. And I think this is a, it, it does highlight um, the issues of your, where you function and how you function, as Ed's pointed out. I mean, it seems a pity that you can't get that kind of governance model um, that is easily replicated, and you don't have to alter it depending uh, on where you are. It seems relatively straightforward. To make it that much more difficult is tricky. And to be honest, getting trustees now, I think, has become more difficult. Uh, I think there was an understanding that their, the sense of their responsibilities needed to be more um, obvious. But for many, that's made life very difficult. And you want knowledge and commitment uh, in terms of how you function. And that knowledge could come in a variety of... You may need specialist knowledge, but you need knowledge and commitment. And for some legally-minded individuals, the knowledge and commitment equals conflict of interest. Well, that, you can't run a charity or indeed any other, really, organisation with that level of ignorance. If you've got knowledge, you're not in conflict. You're knowledge because you, you need it. You need that expertise. 
And I think there, is, there are arguments to be had here on making it a, a simpler and clearer process of governance, uh, recognizing the scope you need to be flexible. Uh, but I think it's well, I suspect that this is an issue which affects a lot more people um, than we normally hear about. So I hope that's been useful um, as a question and with the answers that you've had. Thank you very much. Um, Alex Copeland. Thank you. Alec Copeland of the British Horse Society. What are the positive, positive and negative impact of social media on your organisation? And in this digital and social media era, how should charities stay in touch with a modern audience and stay ahead of the current issues? Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, and uh, as, as a... Uh, uh, someone who tries not to be a social media dinosaur, this is an interesting question for me to be uh, leading on. But um, we at RDA are really excited and think social media is a really, a really brilliant thing. We have a, we have a wide network, um, so there's about 40,000 people who are uh, regularly sort of involved day to day in what RDA does, um, and being able to engage them um, and our supporters, and of course that includes our our participants, so those people who, who ride or carriage drive with RDA. Um, it's a really important way of being able to, to stay in touch with them. One of the things that I particularly love about social media is people share good news in a way they wouldn't otherwise bother to say. So we get lots of those tweets are saying, just been for a fantastic session today, or look at me and my horse, and that you get that positive thing going around. Um, I think, slightly more importantly, it's a really key way for us to get really key messages out um, efficiently, quickly, um, and uh, as we can mentioned before, actually, it's a, it's a cheap way to get to large numbers of people. And it's also a way to give people a, a, a quick and broad uh, view of the extent of what a charity is doing. So um, we know we have people who who think we're doing one thing, and if we can engage them on social media, they quickly realize uh, the broad extent of, of what our charity does. So I think uh, in all those respects, it's great. I should also say from an RDA uh, very specific perspective, it's a fantastic way to engage with uh, some of our participants for whom communication <coughs> is an issue. And we have you know, one of our, our most prolific volunteers uh, uh, in terms of communication and, and a regional publicity volunteer um, is a rider who is constantly telling everybody what he's doing on social media in a really brilliant, positive way and a way that he would find quite difficult without uh, the existence of Facebook and Twitter. Uh, there is, of course, a downside, which we're probably all aware of. So I think the, the ability for um, individuals normally to get hold of either... Um, incorrect, negative, damaging, or, or ill-informed information and spread that very quickly and very widely um, is the downside. I wouldn't overplay that. I think very often, um, if your organization is doing the job right, then there's quite a lot of kind of auto-correct. So the people who don't recognize that side of what you're doing uh, will, will jump in and, and um, moderate that, that argument. But that is obviously um, the downside. Um, in terms of staying ahead, um, for me it's about uh, being planned but not too planned and, and being quite flexible. I think there's a challenge for all of us as more uh, different social media platforms come along. You know, I have uh, a teenage daughter who thinks Facebook is pretty stone age and she absolutely wouldn't be seen dead on Facebook because uh, they, that age group just don't use Facebook anymore. Uh, and there's been you know, all the stuff recently about... Uh, loss of trust in Facebook. So uh, maybe that's something that uh, seems almost unimaginable to say now, but maybe Facebook will fade out and won't become so, won't, won't be as important in the future. So staying ahead of that and trying to, to read what's a pretty complex um, set of platforms and, and media. But ultimately, I think it's a really good thing and, and a positive uh, way for us to communicate. And is it all good, all good news? Um, yes, mostly. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, I'm, I'm sort of 
part of the dinosaur <laughs> uh, category there as far as social media is concerned. But because we work uh, um, only through schools, um, we have the added benefit that um, we have headmasters, headmistresses and teachers who obviously also control that side of things. But I think uh, uh, mostly the, the benefits are, are great because when children go to ride, the people that are involved with the horses have so much passion and there is always a, a, an, an air of, of, of absolute wonder about the children going to ride that normally all the, the messages that we get back is, is only positive feedback. Very good. Yeah, well, we use uh, Facebook a, a lot, I have to say. I think these days peer-to-peer -peer communication seems to be a trusted source of information and um, friends or supporters are, are, are particularly predisposed to become supporters. So we use it a lot because, it, again, it's a, a neat way to wrap up our bite-sized chunks, the little stories you want to tell. A lot of our images are very impactful. You know, we're, we're in Africa a lot, and there are donkeys and communities of children and things. These are things that are very strong images that, that can be rapidly um, disseminated to our supporters. Um, and we use it as a fundraising tool quite, quite a lot. We are also involved a bit in Twitter and Instagram, and maybe that will be an area that will develop in the future. We all recognize the downsides, and we have to monitor our, our uh, Facebook page on a regular basis. You know, holiday makers in Marrakesh riding a, a, on a lame you know, horse, or a, these are rapidly transferred widely and, uh, and to our disadvantage, so we, we have to monitor those. And, um, but as you say, I think the, the benefits far outweigh the disadvantages from our point of view. Well, there are there any negatives? Oh, yes. Um, firstly, in order to harness its power, employ people significantly younger than me. Um, <laughs> without a doubt. Um, but, you know, yes, there are fantastic positives, and I think too much sometimes of emphasis is placed on us putting information out through social media. One of its biggest benefits for us is the information we get back from our donors. We find out what they're interested in, who their favourite horses are, what subjects matter to them, what their opinions on those subjects are. So I think really engaging with the responses is more important in some ways than the posts themselves. Um, and yes, you do have to monitor them as well to make sure the content is appropriate. But, you know, there are a couple of things to throw in. Turmeric, free to a good home. You know, not, there's an all positive things that social media has brought to us. But having said that, um, because social media is so public and the people with such big opinions like to be so public, we now know who they are. And we know how much they're talking about it and where the misinformation is and, and to what serious level. So from, from an intelligence gathering point of view, it has its benefits. I'm, I'm going to ask a stupid question. When you talk about social media, are, are you all talking about your own websites? So we're talking about using social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Well. And, and often they'll point people to the website, which tends to have slightly mm. more static information. And do you find, the, is the website crucial? I mean, it might be a few because everybody uses that, doesn't it, for the They internally. do, yes, but I think, I mean, picking up the point that Jeanette said, I think one of the things, so we, uh, a few years ago, we spent quite a lot of time looking at whether we should be setting up um, sort of chat rooms and message boards, which seem to be things that have kind of, uh, have gone out of fashion now. But what we realised pretty quickly is those, really like Jeanette has just said, those groups of, particularly our volunteers who wanted to do that, were doing that themselves anyway. Uh, and they were bringing together and they were sharing information and as long as you're uh, spending a little bit of time just seeing what's going on there and people aren't um, winding each other up with something that's either either wrong or, or bad then uh, that's actually a really good thing because people are actually able to, to pick up information so it, it may connect to the website yes but actually it's about those communities that can build up and, and, and share information and, and swap good stories and just kind of motivate each other as well which is good. Can I ask a technical question? Only Stuart might be able to answer. Is that technically, is there a difference between what Facebook does and what FaceTime offers? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and is that something, I mean, you do FaceTime? Not or, at all, no. no. Does it, so, you, Facebook, so, yes. Because so, so, you can do groups, can't you? You can, you can do it with WhatsApp, you can do it with those yeah. 
Yeah, so for a, for a charity like ours based across the whole of the UK mm. and possibly for Spana as well around the world, things like FaceTime that allow us yeah. to bring people together to without is having to, yeah. to move everyone yeah. around the country is great. Yeah. 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 Sorry, it was a distraction, but um, and it, it seems, you know, that this... <laughs> The de you know, how do you define digital and social media? Once upon a time, it was, you know, there were one or two ways, methods of doing it, and now there are an awful lot more, mm -hmm. which equally complicates, to some extent, your ability to keep up yeah. with how people want to um, relate. Very good. Any no more comments? Very good. Um, and then uh, David Catlow, from also from oh, look, poised, you can shout at us. <laughs> Thank you very much. In light of DEFRA's announcement to regulate animal sanctuaries in England, uh, should it include horse premises that are charities and rehoming centres? And if so, perhaps comment on the merits or otherwise of licensing versus registration. Thanks for sneaking the extra bit in on the end of that question, David. Um, the simple answer, and I checked, so I know I'm speaking on behalf of all the large equine charities in the UK, is yes. Um, the big issue, though, as we've seen with recent new licensing that's come in, is licensing only works when those enforcing and providing licenses are given the support, the funding, and the training to do it competently. And when they're not, it's a disaster. But assuming that that bit's <laughs> fixed and that that works, then anyone doing a good job should have nothing to fear from, from more public scrutiny. It's, do it's fundraising, it's donors' money that's spending, being spent on what we're doing. Um, and, you know, it, may, we, it just needs to be proportionate as well, so that is there a way of, of organizations that already exist maybe doing a bit of that work themselves? So can Nuke, they already have standards for membership of Nuke. Um, we, th there are things we can do amongst ourselves to regulate, but generally as a point of principles, should rehoming centers and sanctuaries be registered or licensed? Yes, absolutely they should, if the enforcement regime is in place to do it competently. Yes. Um, yeah, this is probably the, the least relevant question to Spana in the well, sense is, that we are uh, we're, we're we're working abroad. But um, I think, in principle, we would totally agree with you um, that it makes sense to license and regulate openness, transparency. All these things are, are, are there to be scrutinised by supporters and donors, and I I think we shouldn't fear it, provided it's done competently. I mean, I'm, I'm I would have a query on your definition of horse premises so if there's a an individual rda group that has its own ponies and rides it at its own place does that qualify as requiring a well uh, yes i mean I, I we wouldn't shy away from it um and indeed the the purpose of the the national body is partly to regulate exactly. that as well so um i suppose i i go back to my point of just if that happens is to is to uh, plead for a bit of joined up thinking mm -hmm. so that we're not um, excuse the pun, saddling our volunteers with too much um, uh, sort of regulation to cope with, but I think it's, it's absolutely right for an RDA centre or a rehoming centre to be, for someone to be uh, regulating and making sure that the welfare and standards are appropriate. But Damien, in a way, you, your foundation is based on um, a lack of access, and some of that is because there are a lack of riding schools, which arguably is a result of... Um, partly as a result of regulation? Well, regulation by the government, yes, mm -hmm. as in, in the fact of business rates um, being uh, uh, so crucial in the closing down of so many riding schools. Mm. So regulation has its, you know, it has to be clearly identified and how it affects. And, and, and also the expertise of the people regulating. Mm. That is probably the most important aspect of it. Yes. And I think that certainly, I mean, this is quite a broad issue in terms of your definition, which means that you need to be really careful about um, what you, the general concept, most people will go, yes, and then you stop and think about all the little things, little places underneath that, that would fit into, um, that would make it a, a very, uh, sort of, oh, hang, hang on, what do we mean by that, and how would it be applied, and would people understand it? And 
this forum has dis discussed um, the numbers of riding schools before and the impacts, uh, the various impacts on them and the numbers available. So I think people would regard it with, a, I think, a certain amount of caution in terms of how it was applied and what you were asking. But the, the general consensus would certainly seem to be uh, yes. Now, I hope that during all of this that uh, one or two of you may have actually even thought of your own questions or felt frustrated <laughs> that you haven't been able to ask. And there is time for you to do this. Uh, and I hope you will follow the example um, of your previous questioners by standing up and telling us who you are and actually waiting for a microphone <laughs> so that we can hear all of that. Um, if, there, if there are indeed um, any others who would like to ask questions that relate to um, how charities fit into the modern world and some of what you've heard this, just now. I can't believe that somebody hasn't been sparked into a... <laughs> what about? There's one here, there's one back there actually. actually and I might go to... Sorry, um, Ian Heaton, Blue Cross again. Um, but just to pick up on the point that was being made earlier around trustees of charities, um, does, does the panel think there is a risk in the horse world that by continuing to, or, or by focusing heavily on the need for equestrian skills when recruiting trustees or, or thinking about that, and I'm not saying all charities do that, but, but I think it does happen, but actually we potentially shut ourselves off to new ideas coming in from lots of um, other industries and so on. Ed and I are both <laughs> chomping at the bit with that. Uh, from, Ladies first. From, uh, oh, no. oh. Go Ed. No, go Ed. Ladies uh, first. Yeah, from, yeah. <laughs> uh, from, um, from my point of view, yes, absolutely. And this is something we see. So the, our, our 500 member groups are all independent charities. So we have about uh, 3,000 trustees across that group. Um, as you said earlier, ma'am, the recruitment of that becomes increasingly difficult uh, as people mistakenly, I think, think they're sort of betting their home on becoming a, a trustee, which is not true. And if they get the governance right, it's not that bad. So um, I think uh, where we, we can absolutely identify our most successful RDA centres, which with those who've diversified their boards of trustees and they've got in business skills, uh, and a wide variety of skills, and they, I mean, uh, obviously they all have to have an interest in the charity, but they don't necessarily have to be uh, people with a really strong in interest in equestrianism. So, yeah, I think it's an important area for us to address. Yeah, and certainly we would say it's the skill set we're looking for first, the fit with the other trustees, because trustees have to work cohesively together as a functioning group, and they have to be a high-functioning group, uh, or the charity will suffer. Um, and then you look at, well, who's interested in giving up their free time for no money? It is people who are interested in, in horse welfare or in helping children with disabilities or disadvantaged children or whatever it might be. So if I think about our trustees, um, yes, they're probably nearly all horse owners, but they're not all horse owners but that's from racehorses to hacks to a donkey at the bottom of the garden. And so they're, they're bringing as many different horsey views to the table as the types of skills. owners that exist. There's, and, and on top of their professional skills, one's the lawyer, one's the accountant, one's the property guy. Um, but they, in order to get the passion to commit, they are going to have a through thread of caring about horses. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, I don't know if anybody's had an experience of... of um, advertising yep. and what you yep. go through you, and do that fairly regularly because I mean some people won't go down there because they think it's you know you, you don't know who you might appear but actually from experience you do get a very interesting cross-section of people who turn out to be really interested in what charity has been doing they've just never been in a position to get connected to it before and I think it, it, you know can, some people do kind of back off the advertisement bit I, yeah, and I think and by bringing people in complete from the outside, you get that person who comes in and starts. Uh, it can be sometimes a bit frustrating as a chief executive, but they start coming in and questioning <laughs> why we're doing things the way we're doing them. That's a, that's a helpful and healthy thing most of the time. Mm. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Um, yes, sorry. Very Eva Bruma from the Anglo-European Start Book. 
Um, I'm really interested in the title, um, How Do Charities Fit Into the Modern World? Because that, that's broad, <laughs> but also perhaps not so easy to define. What do we mean by, by modern world and what are the top changes that you see in the environment in which we all operate um, and, and the challenges that arise from that? Jim, you can... I think this, this covers a whole variety of areas not the least of which, of course, is the uh, somewhat prurient interest that the general public have expressed in, in behaviours of, of charities. So I think we're, we're responding to that. I think it's uh, the, the social media issues. These are, are fundamental things in the way that we approach our potential supporters and donors. Um, the whole environment that we operate in is very much under, uh, under scrutiny now, just as is... Um, the general principle of horse owning and what we do with our horses. These, these are matters that we are often challenged on. So I think it, that's what it refers to. I would say that there's a word potentially missing from the question, which is equine or animal or animal related or something like that, because how do charities fit in the model? We can't answer that. Um, but how do those of us who are focused on animals uh, as charities fit into the modern world? Well, Charities began, to be as quick as I can, boring history lesson, <laughs> charities exist when there is a gap in society that a motivated person identifies. And they are motivated in their own time with their own money to gather their own people together and fill that gap. So if you go right back to the founding of the NSPCC, of the RSPCA, an individual saw a gap in the society's provision and did something about it, Dr. Bernardo. Some of those provisions have, mm -hmm. have now been taken over by the state. And I think it's a bigger, broader question as to whether some of those charities, where the state has now filled that gap, what is their role is perhaps slightly more interesting than what the animal welfare sector's role is because the state plays a relatively small part in animal welfare. Certainly it doesn't flow money into us like it does for adult and children's services, for example. Uh, yes, I think, um, I think it is an interesting question. I think um, uh, my view would be, uh, without wanting to get too political, but in, the age, in, in, in an age of austerity where more of those activities that, from my point of view, uh, looking at social care and provision of activities for disabled people are being withdrawn, uh, we're seeing increasing demand uh, for what we do. And I think there's also a part for us to play, and I'm pleased that you know, we work closely with uh, organizations like the British Equestrian Federation to really hammer home that uh, disabled people have every right to ride and indeed can get a huge amount from it along with lots of other people I'm not saying they get uh, more benefit they just get different benefits and actually pushing that home to making sure so, so we make sure that there is a uh, provision and support for everybody in society and I was just it was mentioned earlier this year is our 50th anniversary um, and uh, we were amused and interested to see that one of our founders writing our uh, original, one of the outline of our original constitution back in 1968, uh, they defined the purpose of the organization as wanting to make sure that there is activity locally so that no disabled person who wants to should be excluded from riding. And I think that's as true today as it was 50 years ago, and that's, that's what charities are doing. And actually, Emil, you're in the best position to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, for us, it's more about the social impact of it and, and how the contact with, um, with horses enrich children's lives. Uh, and I think probably for us, um, you say the modern world, and the modern world actually only emphasizes the larger gap. Um, for example, we have a project in Hull which I found out is the third poorest city in Europe. Um, and as Ed just said, that every disabled child should have the right to ride. Well, actually, every child yeah. should have the right to ride. Um, and, and for us, it's the, the actual social impact that it has on, on the children's lives. Now, uh, we get most of our feedback through the schools, because we only operate through schools. and. Um, the, the headmasters, the, the, the teachers of these children 
say that, first of all, they have to have 100% school attendance in order to be able to take part in, in, in the project. So school attendance improves. Um, uh, but more, their social behavior change. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proven fact that contact with animals improve their social behavior. And that, for us, is, is, is probably our biggest drive to try and, 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 and uh, go forward. But I, I have one interesting story in, in the fact that we, we took a couple of children, well, a group of children, and there was a girl of an ethnic minority group who, when we asked them to come forward and pat the horses, uh, refused. And thinking that she was scared, um, I went to a sister to come and she said, no, 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 I can't. Uh, people of my color, we're not allowed to ride. And that really brought it home to me, the, the, the social impact of it. And that's the modern world. I mean, I think you're, uh, it, the modern world is, a, um, is an interesting uh, question. But f a lot of the conversations we have here about education is the recognition that there are m more people who are interested in horses who have no background with livestock of any shape, size, or description. So knowledge is probably missing to some of those who, who want to be involved in, in horses, but in other animals as well. But in RDA's case, you're evolving to meet changing attitudes. Uh, when they started, there were many more special schools, and it was actually easier for the, the disabled groups to ride because they had schools who understood the value and could send them, and they came together. Now, most of those schools will have been closed because they are now in mainstream schools who do not see riding in the same way that the special schools did. So you've had to evolve in some ways to um, the, the statutory system wanting to involve um, levels of disability in, in mainstream schools has actually lessened their uh, opportunities to do other things like swimming uh, and like riding. So I think you do have to evolve because the recognition of certain issues changes but does leave gaps. And I think it's quite right, it leaves gaps. And sometimes those gaps uh, get smaller and then things change. And they get very good, and you move on. Um, the Animal Health Trust actually didn't start looking, you know, at issues in well, equine dogs and cats. It was farm animals, but it made the point that the state needed to do that uh, more fully, which it now does. But it left a gap with companion animals, which still isn't filled in that sense but isn't always recognized, you know, unless there's an outbreak of something or people see a lot of those. But it fills a gap. Um, and it, I think we, we need to recognize that there are those um, older charities who've actually been very good at adapting to the, to the needs and the changes in society. But the society has had an impact on all of those um, charities and, and the way in which they function. And if people now decide to set up, and quite often that is about, oh, I'll rescue an odd pony or something like that. They may not have that knowledge that allows them to do that. They may have the interest and commitment to a, a cause. But they may not have the knowledge, uh, which was, once upon a time would have been probably more readily available. And I suspect that m modern will always be a movable feast, but I would be grateful that there are enough charities out there with a specialist interest um, and understanding to be able to respond to the way that, that the society changes. So and thank you all very much indeed for that. And I think on that point, you probably have earned your lunch. Um, but I hope you'll see you later. <laughs>